All right, we are live back at the Double R Diner on another Friday. <laughs> Indeed. Um, you said you wanted to talk about, uh, you wanted to get in some pop culture takes, or I mean, uh, you said specifically you wanted to cover some of what I said about Day of the Dead. Is that right? Yeah, that was about a week ago. I saw that and I was, because I had just seen it for the first time last year. Okay. And I was pretty impressed with it because Romero, to me, is kind of hit or miss. Yeah, he sucks. Well, his first, for those that don't know, Romero was, you know, he was Night of Living Dead, as we'll put him on the pop culture map. And a lot of people then is maybe not so much. <coughs> the film Night of Living Dead dropped in 1968, and it was filmed deliberately in black and white, even though, I mean, it was, that was, um, you know, Technicolor had, had long since become normal. So it, it was, it was kind of marketed almost as like an art house film. You know, and everybody read into it as like this metaphor for Vietnam and and you know Cold War apocalyptic anxieties. Uh, I I mean him, Romero was a he's a typical a typical kind of Berkeley liberal type um, in his outlook. I mean he's an East Coast guy, but and then uh, Martin is that film that was another kind of art house film that kind of put him on the map. But no, I'm with you. I I've got like no use for the for the prick, but Day of the Dead, it's it's so it's so much an on the nose Cold War piece that uh I, I like it. And the, it also uh the the kind of tension between um you know there's this coterie of arrogant scientists who were who are just kind of as the military as the as the infantry captain says, you know, literally jerking themselves off. They're just they find, you know, kind of the the zombie virus almost like a curiosity you know and the military's notion is just to like you know blow the shit out of them because firepower solves all you know all problems that that's very much um there there was very there was very much public discourse in the final phase of the cold war between you know to put carl sagan on the map um it was his book cosmos was a bestseller but it it wasn't um he he wasn't it wasn't like now where like, you know, it, where you, the, the, the kind of pop science guys like Neil deGrasse Tyson are, are kind of just uh, producing these dumbed down takes on on complicated theoretical science. Uh, the uh, There was very much a public policy orientation relating to, relating to the arms race and nuclear weapons, obviously. And, you know, the whole, the concept of nuclear winter that was that phrase was coined by Sagan, I believe. And if it wasn't actually coined by him initially, it was popularized by him. So you had this kind of constant um, push pull between these Pentagon types who'd say like, well, that's not so nuclear war is in fact winnable. You've got to look at nuclear weapons like any other, like any other uh, technology destructive as it may be. Um, but talking about it, if it's, you know, this uh, a catalyst for apocalypse is nonsense. You know, and then, um, you know, with kind of obvious disdain for the military and what it represented, you know, these scientists that kind of, you know, be all go, how dare you, you know, we're the, we're the, we're the priesthood of science, you know, you, you can't tell us what, you know, who's going to, you don't understand these technologies like we do. So I mean, Day of the Dead's very much playing on that. And, you know, like I said, I, you know, even as a little kid and, uh, and then, you know, like an early adolescent in the eighties, uh, I, it's hard to convey to people who didn't live through it how frightening things were, like the potential, the real potentiality of of nuclear war. And it's not like you thought about it consciously every day, but it was kind of always in the back of your mind. And that's why it's goofy when people act like, I mean, I, even though some of these like news anchors who are, I mean, like dudes and ladies are like older than me, you know, talk about when there's some kind of confabulated emergency like COVID. You know, like this. You know, we we've never endured anything like this before. It's like I don't know, man. Like I, I, I think the prospect of global thermonuclear war was more frightening than the seasonal flu. Call me crazy, but it um, that's uh, that's why I like Day of the Dead. Um, but it's also I think I mean it's weird for it really. You know, you don't really see the zombies much in that movie. At the end, there's yeah. that whole really gory segment where they they're tearing people apart and. It's kind of like this orgy of blood and guts, but for most of it, the strength of the film is its dialogue. You know, it's like, um, it's almost like a stage play. There's very few set pieces. It's the nuclear bunker or like the missile silo 
there's like the mine area where they keep the zombies they're studying. And then there's a, and then there's their living quarters, which is like a bunker, but that's really all you see. And there's only the, the opening shot where they're, they're flying the shop or there's downtown, downtown Orlando, where it gives, it's, that's kind of like the world building shot because it shows that, you know, the dead have like overrun everything. But beyond that, it could very easily, it could be a stage play. It's almost like Reservoir Dogs, you know, but that, that adds to like the claustrophobia of it. So I, I think it's really dope. Um, but there's, um, there's a handful of directors like that. Like, like I hate Brian De Palma. I think he's a horrible filmmaker. And Oh, really? That, yeah, The Untouchables is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. And Casualties oh, really? of War, I think, is one of the worst movies ever made. But Scarface is incredibly dope. And he made uh, he made something else I really like, but I can't remember. Uh, it'll, it'll come to me. But it's, <laughs> point being, there's filmmakers who I think are shit in terms of their politics and their aesthetic sensibilities who nevertheless uh, produce some kind of one-off that's really great. But... And Day of the Dead's case too. I'm not sure because I, I I've never flipped through the production notes or like deep dived into it. I think Tom Savini had a lot of creative control over it. He was that nutty like makeup and effects guy. That's right. Um. Yeah. Of course. You know. But he. Uh. I. I think he had a lot of creative control. And when Romero's Romero originally wanted it to be this kind of big crazy epic, and then he couldn't get the budget he wanted, and then he kind of like threw his hands up. I, and I think Savini kind of stepped in, so that's that's why there's not these. That's why there's not the kind of simpletons, uh, like uh, you know, like hippie politics to it. But um, yeah, no, that's why that's why I raised it. I generally, I uh, generally, if I raise a a movie like that, it's because it, I I think it it's it I think I think it's because I think it conveys something about the about the epoch and uh day of the dead is, is definitely a, a cold war movie i should come i should come i should put a list together of like essential cold war films um yeah. i mean there's obvious stuff like fail safe and like the manchurian candidate then the day after but there's not so obvious. mystery grove had some compilation of movies i don't know if that was a best of or if it was anything specific okay that might be a yeah he movie. he's got some he, he put some interesting stuff out there i know he's an indie publisher too and but I mean, aside, he publishes some good stuff. But I mean, just in terms of things that his takes and and some of the stuff that he he puts out there. But yeah, I I should I should compile a Cold War movie list. Um, I think people might dig that. Would you? Uh, did you ever see FX? FX. Yeah, that's with uh. Yeah, Brian Dennehy. Yeah, yeah. Is that yeah, the I remember that. that. He was in that Tom Cruise movie, that stupid one. Um, I think it's Cocktail. Anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is that the yeah. guy? Okay. Anyway. Cocktail was about, it was, it was like Top Gun, except it's about a guy like pouring drinks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. What's um, hilarious about Cocktail, that's when, uh, that was the Beach Boys' big comeback, that really stupid song, Kokomo, like that was on the soundtrack, the Cocktail. It's the Beach Boys' big comeback in 88. And, um, oh man. The Beach Boys are like a weird, creepy band, though. Like they, it, you know how like Brian Wilson was like buddies with Manson? Like he, right. they, they downplayed it. Like, oh, they just crossed paths. Like, nah, man. Like Brian Wilson was like, he'd, he'd chill with Manson. He'd like banged a couple of the Manson family girls, and like they, he, he they, 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 he hung out with the dude. You know, like it, it, it and um, I, I knew this crazy guy, uh, uh, who I grew up with. Uh, kind of a, uh, he was one of those dudes who like he had some. As a musician, he had some chops, but he wasn't like that good. But he was convinced that like he was gonna like break through, even though like he kind of sucked. I mean, everybody knows some cat like that, but uh, 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 he but he did have a lot of musical knowledge. Okay, like about bands and stuff. And uh, he uh he was always insisting that Pet Sounds was like this incredible record. And I mean, the Beach Boys, I was always kind of like whatever. But they were they were a really interesting band, and they were up on some stuff that had a huge impact on like a lot of prog acts and things later. But um, the there's, there's it's there's a there the things around them, not just Wilson. They're just totally bizarro. And uh, but yeah, so when I think of cocktail, I think of, yeah, 1988, that stupid freaking Kokomo song. Yeah. That, well, uh, and David McGowan wrote about uh, the yeah one who, the one who passed away. It's just a really strange the one the one member of the Beach Boys who could swim or surf. That is the one who has end up in this 
in this interesting circumstance. So, no, McGowan's got a whole. He's an interesting guy. McGowan lost, and he he died sadly of, of cancer. That and it, it, it took him. It overtook him really rapidly. I was sad to hear that. Kind of right when I got into reading his stuff. Like I, I started looking him up, and his daughter's like, you know, my father Dave is very, very sick, and I'm like, oh shit, you know. So it's, I, I never even got to like email the guy or anything. He was, he's died, but um, but he rest in peace. But uh, I, his, 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 his he, he lost me with his moon landing thing because that's ridiculous. You know, he's one of these like the moon landing was a hoax type guys. But uh, the book he wrote, Program to Kill, um, that's a disturbing book. And there's there's a lot of things in it that I agree with. Uh, I I don't he I don't I don't buy the MK Ultra angle and all that stuff. But there's there's something to what he says about what the epidemic of serial murder and just violence generally from the 60s to the 90s. There were strange things being insinuated into the culture of a sexual nature of a of a violent nature that really. Um, uh, kind of loosen the reins, as it were, on people's internal control mechanisms. Um, that's one of the reasons I like the film Jacob's Ladder, which is a horrifying movie. Like, it really is. And uh, was, there, was Stanley Kubrick ever tied to that? I don't think so. Okay. Adrian Lyne, or Lynn, what put him on the map was Fatal Attraction, which is kind of a tawdry movie, and it's really badly cast. It's like, if you're going to make a movie like Fatal Attraction... It's like Cass and Broad, who's like really sexy, but it seems kind of deviant, like Elizabeth Pena. Like Glenn Close, like like Glenn <laughs> Close, like is about as it, I I'd want to see her naked about as much as I want to see Hillary Clinton naked. You know, it's like it's like get the fuck out of here. Well, to to bring it back to Brian De Palma, Glenn yeah, Close yeah. was recommended for the uh what was her name? What's the broad's name? But the Michelle Pfeiffer role. And Brian De Palma said Glenn Close is not worthy of this role. So he at least had the the fortitude to yeah okay fair enough it oh, yeah. uh but yeah mcgowan um he he wrote a book i mean i'm sure you know all this he wrote a whole book about laurel canyon and you know yeah. jim morrison's dad was a naval officer i, I think he was a captain or something and then in the navy a, a military stud is correct me if i'm wrong i think a navy captain is the equivalent of like a bird colonel in the army so i mean he was he was a big shot and a bunch of these guys um like a bunch of these guys in in, in kind of the the hippie movement and you know who became associated with it in pop culture uh um mediums that like their fathers or whatever like you know were like military brass like to the point that it seems like more than a coincidence i mean i don't read into it as much as mcgowan did but it is strange and um it uh you know like, like all kinds of horrible stuff's happening in laurel canyon you know like the the wonderland murders it's a case i'm kind of fixated on because it's That's so very movie. strange like in the the film Wonderland is dope with Val Kilmer. It uh, that that's a really unsung kind of. I mean, if you like crime and heist movies, it's dope. But it's also it, it's it shows you kind of like how. I like it too. It's kind of like the anti boogie nights. It shows like how kind of sick like yeah. pornography is and things. And it's like yeah, it, and that's basically accurate. Like I, I researched it quite a bit. And there's um there's a guy who maintains a a blog wonderland 1981 he's like obsessed with this case and he's um a bunch of the people who were involved in it um he uh he uh he he contacted them like those who remain alive and and like the guy ron lanius the unhinged uh, wonderland gang leader uh he like, he talked to some of lanius's relatives who you know it, it's really fascinating stuff i mean it's a horrible horrible case on youtube actually um the Wonderland, uh, that was the first crime scene that was videotaped on camcorder and uh, shown to the jury. And on YouTube, I I don't know if it's still up there or not, but the whole video was on YouTube and they, they see the bodies, people with their heads bashed in. I'm like, Jesus Christ, like YouTube, it's like you'll, you'll pull people for, uh, you'll, you'll, pull, you'll, you'll pull videos of somebody, you know, shows like bare breasts or something and you're showing people with their heads split open. Like, uh, yeah, and there's one... Uh, um, I can't remember the guy's name. The other, the other male victim, he is his, uh, buddy. He's like in his boxer shorts and like a Dago tee, like slump, like by the couch, like this. And like, you see, like, you can, like the dude's head's like bashed open. I, I could not believe they kept that up. Uh, but in any event, um, if, uh, I highly recommend the film Wonderland. And if you, if you got a strong stomach, check out the Wonderland 1981 blog.
it's full of stuff and all kinds of documentary evidence and Eddie Nash too. The uh, he he's a bizarre figure and he he was involved in uh he crossed paths with all kinds of personages of of the '60s and things for strange reasons. But it um it uh yeah yeah. But no, I don't. I <clears throat> to bring it back. I I know that people really like Brian De Palma, and they 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 get on my ass because I think he's horrible. But it, I uh, I just I don't know. There's something there's something just like on the nose obnoxious about the way he scripts dialogue, and I I, I find Cowboys of War to be a really kind of offensive movie. Like I not because I'm like some patriot's hard, but it's, it's just gross. It's like it's it's just like quasi pornographic. There's a weird like white nationalist connection to that movie too. Um, that actual case, you know, because I, I mean, it, it's unfortunately it's based on a real event where that 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 poor girl was raped and killed. One of the guys who got courts martialed and convicted. Uh, he did some time, and then his uh his case got uh on appeal. I don't know how the military justice system works, but his uh his sentence got commuted. He comes back stateside, and then in the 1990s, he becomes this honcho in the World Church of the Creator. You know, the Matt Hale's uh, outfit. And uh, he got into he got into some kind of, like, argument with this black dude and, like, blew the guy away. Something like that. And he, like, ended up going to prison for a hate crime. It's just kind of weird. But, um, yeah, I... Uh, I think we would, like... Body double. I don't know if you've ever saw that. Yeah, I think I have. I think I have. It's it, a. Uh, admittingly, it's a Hitchcock rear window and. Right. Yeah. Window. No, that wasn't bad. And I think he. I think the poem. I, I could be wrong, but the the updated version of DOA from 1987. I can't remember if the poem did or not, but that was pretty good. And that was another thing. It was, yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, because in the in the 80s, that became there was a lot of Hitchcock homage kind of stuff. No, I, I like that stuff. I, I like Albert Hitchcock. I, like I've said before, I, I really like Vertigo. I like Marnie. I like um, I even liked Albert Hitchcock Presents. I, Albert, Alfred Hitchcock Presents when it was good, it was as dope as um, as when The Outer Limits was good. I mean, it was it was a lot less far out and weird than than Outer Limits, but it was no, that's that's good stuff. I. I never thought Albert Hitchcock was corny. I mean, some of his stuff is better than others, but um, and yeah, and Scarface. Uh, Scarface, though, if you watch the original Scarface by Howard Hawks, I'm a huge Howard Hawks fan, you know. And like oh, John really? Car John Carpenter actually is. I got turned on to Howard Hawks because of John Carpenter, you know, because that's that's the reason Carpenter did the thing, you know. And that's and if you watch um. if you watch uh, if you watch a Saul in Precinct Thirteen, it's a big homage to Rio Bravo. But um, I uh, I uh, the original Scarface uh, it, it's not just dope because it takes you know because it's 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 filmed in Chicago and everything, and I really like that era, you know. But uh, the uh, the 1983 Scarface um, you know uh, it, it's a lot bloodier, obviously, and 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 over the top, but it 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 very much draws upon the original Scarface, you know, so that wasn't. I think it owes to part of that, that's part of why it's so good. Um, but it's just like great acting in it, like uh, like the guy who plays um, the guy who plays Sosa, you know, like the oh, yeah. he's like the Strassner type, like drug lord slash, like you know, uh, like Latin American dictator, like that guy's dope. Like he he he's, and he he sees convincing, you know, <laughs> like right, right. and like that. Uh, it's just yeah, it's uh. I, I don't know. Scarface is just—it's just—it's just cool. I mean, uh, and it's uh, people act like it's over the top, and I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, like uh, like Tony Montana, like you know, like t you know, having like a magazine emptied into him, and he's still like you know, firing the uh, firing off his uh his M sixteen. I mean, that's ridiculous. But uh, the uh. Like the Colombians, like chainsaw on his friend's head. Like the cartel actually does stuff like that, man. Like, <laughs> I mean, that's the reason why they, that's why they're effective because they're they're sick people. You know, I mean, they. That's not uh, that's not just some kind of like horror movie fantasy stuff. I mean, I plus, if uh, 
like a documentary cocaine cowboys i recommend to people because that's really that's a re it's really compelling you know and they, they talk to a bunch of guys who were in the in the dope game in the 80s and a, a bunch of guys who were you know who were police and stuff in miami like miami was totally insane in the 80s like guys uh shooting it out with uh with like spray and pray weapons and like shopping malls and shit like this stuff like really happened it wasn't you know so that's something like people watch scarface today and and you know they're like oh that's ridiculous it's like not really i mean that you know that, that kind of shit really was happening you know it uh it was different world right right yeah i just i guess i'm in a movie mindset after after seeing the new batman so i, I saw academic agent was uh prepping his april month for a lot of a lot of content it's a bad person don't don't be a, an islamo sexist i know that's true that's true yeah, it's the bad person what uh who directed who directed the the new batman film it was matt reeves who did cloverfield and the recent ah. the recent planet of the apes reboots okay so, yeah i haven't seen any of the apes movies the the cloverfield movies are uh the original cloverfield uh was kind of dope like the one about the giant monster yeah, like yeah. i didn't i the sequel the Indian universe sequels i didn't like the one where john goodman is the fallout shelter i thought that one was dumb it was just like a it, it reminded me of some of the it, it was like it reminded me of like m night Shyamalan kind of shit but the okay. the original cloverfield i thought was pretty dope and uh i like uh i like the, i like the bugs that live on the cloverfield monster and like when they bite you they make you blow up like that's i, I thought that was kind of dope and like that girl like uh there's like this kind of cute girl and she gets bit and then she fucking like i i didn't see that coming i remember when i saw it i'm like oh shit <laughs> but it um and there's like not a lot to it. I mean, it's, it's just like a giant. It's 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 just like a giant monster movie. It's I mean, so it's not like great filmmaking or something. But I, I thought it was pretty cool. I was I was kind of pleasantly surprised. I there's this. Uh, I remember saw when it came out. I there's a theater in the South Loop, and and like I took my then girlfriend uh, to see it, and I was kind of pleasantly surprised. Um, I haven't watched it since it, since I saw it in the theater. I mean, maybe it, it doesn't hold up well, but I uh, probably not. Yeah, but I for what for the time there wasn't a lot of great stuff coming out in the early two thousands. I mean, there's a couple of things. There were like Apocalypto is one of my very favorite movies. Like, there's a handful of really dope films that dropped in the two thousands. But my point is, it's not like it was some great decade for movies. But I, Chlorophyll was better than I thought it would be. But then I I watched um. I watched 10 Cloverfield Lane um, online when I was sick, like a couple of years ago. And uh, I kept, uh, I kept waiting for some kind of like callback to like the Cloverfield, the original. And it, it's like, this is just stupid. And like, it, it's so obvious that like the take was going to be like, oh, you know, actually there are fucking aliens or something. Like it's, because otherwise the movie would have been pointless. It was just about some like pervert fat guy. Like, I mean, it's like, what, what's the point of that? But it's, um, it was dope though, like when you just like shot that hipster faggot in the head though. Like I thought that was hilarious. Like <laughs> it's like okay, that's yeah. Um, I don't know. Like it, yeah, because I he's like some beard guy in like some freaking jig off like hipster shirt. I, I don't know, but it's um. And then they made a third one. Um, I, I watched part of it. The one where in the, in the space station, and uh, there's some kind of like time eddy, and but it didn't. I I I didn't finish it because I think I, I got so bored with it. I think I just like quit the movie. But I um that's a difficult thing to everybody's ever tried to do that, create some kind of like film brand anthology. You know, that's what Carpenter was trying to do with Halloween three, which is which is an awesome movie, but like audiences never go for it. You know, like that's why Cloverfield is a franchise just kind of like shit the bed because nobody cares about it. Like you can't it just like doesn't work. You know, it, it, it's like a high-minded concept, but I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I said, I don't think those Cloverfield sequels were particularly good, but even if they were, like it, that, you, you can't you can't treat a, a movie franchise like like you can like a cable series or something. Like it doesn't work. But um, but no, I didn't um, I didn't know that was the same dude who did uh, the bad person who did Cloverfield. What was your What was your take on the bad person? Did you like it? I was sort of feeling some melancholy afterwards. I was really ambivalent overall, but I, I really like the the direction that Batman as a character is going through. And that's really the only thing that really needs to go right. 
Um, but yeah, it's it's more moody, more more emotion based. Is it more What's like? Uh, is it more? Um, is like is it like a Frank Miller kind of take, or is it more like a little bit? Little okay, because they seem to be getting away from that more and more. I was never like a DC Comics guy. Like I I liked I liked uh, heavy metal, like the the comic magazine a lot, and uh, I like Dark Horse comics. Like when I was a kid, the Terminator comic was dope, and I like. I like I like Dead World a lot by Vince Locke. I never really got into DC, but um, the uh, I know that a lot of I know that a lot of like comic fanboys they're kind of divided because with the bad person they uh, you know, there's the guys who are they really like you know kind of like the Dark Knight motif, and there's other dudes who like think that's overdone. But um, who's the main antagonist in it? Is it the Riddler? Uh, well, there's two. There's, I guess, the main one's the Riddler, but also the the Penguin is Colin Farrell. Okay. I, think you'd, I think you'd really like him because he's trying to imitate an Italian mob boss, and I I think it's very convincing. I think it's better than the Riddler, to tell you the truth. I really yeah. like Batman Returns, you know, because I kind of like like Tim Burton when he's on, he's really on, and uh, yeah, yeah. Batman Returns was a huge homage to Fritz Lang, you know, and it's so I and like people. That's, that movie was actually controversial when it dropped because people thought it was like upsetting and gross. But I'm like, but that's why it works, you know. And um, I uh, that's the only that's the only bad person movie I really liked was uh was was Batman Returns. But um, that's the one with know, Christopher Walken. Yeah, it's got yeah, Christopher like Walken. It. It's got Michelle Pfeiffer. It's got Danny DeVito as the Penguin. Um, but it's like Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton was a really interesting actor. He he kind of faded, but he. I even liked him, and people are probably gonna like get angry about this. But you know the the remake of RoboCop from 2014. I yeah, thought that really was really dope, okay. and Michael Keaton was in that. And uh, the reason why I like it, it's not nearly as good as the original, but that movie and movie Chappie is really got interesting things to say about modern warfare. You know, and the demanding of the battlefield. Um, I, I thought so, but that was, I, I, I didn't mean to digress off topic, but that was like the last film I remember Michael Keaton being in, but he was really good. And, um, like when he, when he got cast by Tim Burton as, as Bruce Wayne, people complained, but I'm like, no, it's perfect. Cause Bruce Wayne's supposed to be a freaking weirdo. He's not supposed to be this like right. alpha male stud. It's like fucking guy dresses up like a bat and beats the shit out of people. Like it's not normal behavior, you know, like, um, and I didn't, uh, what bothered me about the Christopher Nolan bit, Batman movies was that, like, something about it didn't work. Like, he, this, like, hyper-realism, it's like, okay, so you're filming in Lower Wacker Drive in Chicago, it's, like, Blade Runner-like, Batman's driving around a Humvee, but he's, like, a dude in a bat suit. Like, that doesn't, that doesn't work. It looks weird. Right. Like, the Tim Burton stuff works because, um, you know, Fritz, Fritz Lang, that kind, of, that kind of Fritz Lang style, like, it, it, it looks... It, it, it looks comic-y, but not, you know, too on the nose. So, I, I don't know. But I I got turned off of The Bad Person by Christopher Nolan, I guess. But uh, I, um, yeah, I hadn't, uh, I, I didn't even know there was a new Batman movie. But I, uh, I hang out at the mall a lot, not because, like, I'm a teenage girl from 1987. Um, but because, uh, like, when I transfer buses that, like, they all transfer at the mall, and so like I, I go in there and I chill. And uh, there's a big AMC theater there, and so the other day I'm just like, ah, oh, shit, let's play in the theater, you know. And it's like, oh well, wow, there's there's a new Batman movie, but um, yeah, I didn't even know um, I didn't even know it was coming out, but uh, that's uh, that's all the uh, like I was talking to Greer about. I mean, that's there's a reason why that's what Hollywood puts out because it, um, you know, in 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 the, in a global in a global media marketplace, you know, you you got to appease uh you you got to appease regimes like that in China, and you know you you get a guaranteed return on investment for stuff like comic movies, and there's not gonna there's not gonna be controversy over moral issues or political stuff, and you're gonna see that more and more. You know, you're you're gonna see less and less political content of any sort in movies. Um, but yeah, who who plays the Riddler in in the Bat Person? Oh, it's uh, Paul Dano. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, uh, yeah, no, it's interesting. It's uh, they're kind of trying to 
edge into the whole uh like domestic terrorist you know he's like basically he's he's ted kaczynski okay and so but i mean it's really like it's not convincing like that's not a i mean the, the character is interesting i'm not putting that down but yeah. it, it's totally going into the whole like uh you know right-wing extremist angle so yeah it's really ham-fisted that's why the penguin you know it's a timeless classic it's this like mod oh, yeah. that one's a lot more uh less social programming with that one so that's why there's kind of different dynamics at play with within the movie yeah no i yeah that's interesting that's interesting. yeah i've been i'm trying to think of the last uh like like newer recent film i've, I've seen I, I can't even think of it i've spent uh i think uh shit i think the last i think the last movie i saw in the theater was 1917 you know which was oh really like, yeah, it was a letdown. I mean, I, I like the way it was filmed, but uh, I've got issues with that. I'll, I'll give that movie a write up sometime if anyone's interested. But there's there's not enough films made about the First World War anyway. Um, which uh, but I I'm trying to think if I saw if there's anything I've seen after subsequent to that. I I don't know. It's been yeah. There's just not. There's just it's been forever and a day since there's a movie I I got excited about. Um. And then like the COVID bullshit happened. It's like I couldn't go to the movies anyway. But um, right. yeah, yeah, I don't know. What are people saying and um and shit? Uh, Charlemagne says he would love to read about 1917. So okay, I'll write about it. Um, yeah, we got we got a bunch of people in here. Let's see. Oh, I think he was asking if you saw that uh Governor Arnold video about Russia. No, but Arnold's a fucking idiot. Yeah, I, uh, my mom was asking me about it, and it's like, do I even need to watch it to know what the take is? It's, uh, yeah, yeah. He's, I mean, it's Schwarzenegger's, he's always been a shithead. I mean, Trump had his number. I mean, the guy's, the guy's, the guy's a jag off. Like, what I, well, it's like none of these, I mean, first of all, I mean, there's, there's a, there's, there's just, you know, a, a quorum of fools, as there always is in this country. But I mean, it's like, what I, what, what what am I going to get out of these people's takes? I mean, and why and what what gives them the authority to even speak on this? Like I, one of the reasons I like McGregor is not just because it's not just because I think he's a fascinating guy, but I mean the guy, um, you know, he spent uh, he spent most of his military career in the folded gap. I mean, as a teenager, you know, he lived in Germany for years. He he uh, he commissioned a whole study on the East German Army and uh, the the Soviet and and the uh, National Volks Army Military Alliance, which he turned into a book, which is fascinating. It's literally called the Soviet East German Military Alliance. I mean, even if you don't see eye to eye with McGregor on politics, I mean, he's a guy who's got authority to speak on the matter. Okay, if we're talking about security concerns in Central Europe and specifically the Russian army. I mean, aside from the fact that the guy's like a meathead and just like a fucking dickhead politician like why 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 am i gonna like listen to schwarzenegger like what he has what his take is it's like it's like okay, that's that's great man that i i'm, I'm happy for you <laughs> you know it's like what like what kind of insights because he, he possibly have i mean it's uh but isn't that fucking idiot arnold i mean wasn't in 2003 wasn't he saying that like we got to go to war in iraq because it's you know we got to fight terrorists like i mean it's, it's like okay guys you're so, so our, in, in other words, Arnold's, Arnold's take on foreign policy is it's okay to assault countries thousands of miles away for no particular reason, but Russia's borders off limits. It's okay, guy. That, that, that that's a great take. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a pretty good summary. I want to thank before I forget. Doom sent five dollars, tossing tossing a couple of post-apocalypse Chuck E. Cheese <laughs> coins your way. <laughs> Thanks, lads. Cheers. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it um no th thank you everybody for, for showing up and participating i i really appreciate that i mean that's the whole point um here this one took me by surprise charlemagne said i like battleship unironically i i don't know man that's it's a pretty risky take i'm not sure uh i yeah i never saw it so i can't i can't comment i mean it uh yeah that was uh well i don't know you you might take that one the hardest thomas because uh they're they're really trying to get into like the navy, like American Navy. Uh, <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know, man. No, I, I can't. I, I haven't seen it, so I, I I suspect I would not like it. But I can't probably put shade on it because I have not seen it. So, 
I mean, people can like whatever they want, man. I, I try not to be too mean if you, about stuff. I mean, unless it's unless it's something like indefensible, like like if somebody comes out and says that like Death Leopard is like the dopest band ever or something, like I, I don't know. No, I hear you. Or if they say that like William Shire, or, like he's a, he wrote a really great book on the Third Reich. I mean, like a, there's some stuff that's like in, indefensible, but or if somebody um, claims that like Biden actually was elected president, but. It, uh, a regular Oscar Toe Ace, if you like Lynch, check out some Ken Russell films. You'll probably dig them. Thank you, man. All right, we got some more. We got some more. Oh, uh, someone asks uh, Megalator Thomas, do you listen to Ed Opperman? Yeah, I really like the Opperman report, and and Ed Opperman's a he's a really sharp guy. Um, I particularly like um. I particularly liked uh, what he had to say. I don't want to get into this here, not because I'm afraid of controversy, but I, I, I don't want to totally change gears. Um, he uh, he did he he hosted Gary Meese repeatedly, who uh, who wrote about the West Memphis Three case, and that's a perfect example of of media creating a narrative that is just completely at odds with reality. And uh, Opperman. Uh, his, his work that he's done on the Son of Sam case, too. Uh, I've got a lot of respect for Opperman. And, yeah, his, his, the Opperman report is dope. I part ways with him on some things. I, and he, I think he steers into some conspiratorial thought. But um, he's overall, he's, he's dope. Yeah, I love the Opperman report. All right. Someone, someone says, who is it? This person says I unironically started capitalizing stuff when taking notes in class because of Thomas. Yeah, that's no. I people are always asking about that, and I, I didn't deliberately try. I'm not just trying to be a weirdo. It's two things. Uh, capitalization for emphasis. You see that in German. That's why like Yaki did that a lot, but also um, in legal writing. Um, you capitalize for emphasis. Okay, particularly in addressing the court. Um, because it's supposed to be, you know, at a glance, you know, the the issues presented. Okay. I mean, that, that's why, like, I started doing it. And as it became second nature, um, you know, now, like, I feel weird not doing it. Like, people act like it's some crazy thing. Like, no, I'm not, I'm not saying um, that that comment was aiming at that, but that, that's why. But, no, I appreciate it, man. Nice. All right. Charlemagne has coming in with the defense for battleship, making a pretty good case. The, uh, <laughs> the aliens can't, can't come. No, I mean, that, that's, 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 that, that's cool. I mean, I, we were talking about, um, we were talking about James Webb on the timeline a couple of weeks ago and about how the Iowa class ships were, were taken out of being mothballed and, uh, they were, uh, they were refitted, um, with, uh, with, with modern hardware, including, uh, you know, tactical nuclear capability and i made the point that you know it, it's controversial naval nerds will take exception to this but the kirov class battle cruiser that the soviets had it was basically like the thing was like this ridiculous fucking it was basically like a like a nuclear dreadnought okay like it's um and uh that that was one of the catalysts for uh bringing the iowa class back but also uh in uh in in nuclear war planning by the 1980s um the idea was to force warsaw pact to fight a think of it as a two-front nuclear war um and obviously uh you know you need uh you need naval weapons platforms to to wage a nuclear war in the pacific um and that goes without saying so that it's a fascinating topic um no, i i probably know battleship is a dope movie is um I've never seen it. Did uh, Charlemagne ask? Did you see the movie Midway? That's from 2019. No, I'm, I, I remember when it came out, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, that one. Was, I think that one was pretty good. And I think most people here are pretty supportive. I'm surprised that was directed by Roland Emmerich. That's no uh, kidding. So usually, usually that's not something I would check out. So. Yeah, that. Yeah, I, I think Independence Day is one of the worst movies ever made. Yeah, no, that's, uh, you know, uh, another channel predicted that that's kind of the beginning of the the modern Spielberg blockbuster ripoff. Yeah, I think that that's insightful. Yeah. No, the 90s still, uh, it, um, I mean, like we, like I talked about on, on, on 
on Mr. Greer's uh, pod, you know, uh, since, since since the late seventies, uh, you know, kind of the blockbuster has been king, but there was still there was still very there was there were still dynamic scripts that were getting through and and um and and getting real uh, production uh, support um, until the early nineties. There were still studio movies that were kind of outside of the paint by numbers formula, but yeah, the independent, yeah, that's insightful, man. I, I agree with you. I'm just kind of thinking aloud, but, uh, yeah, I really, really, really hate independence. Day. It's yeah. just like so fucking stupid. Well, it's, it's taking everything down a notch. That's kind of the beginning of, you know, the, the eighties audience was decently smart, but now we have to lower the bar a little more just to just no, it's a good way to put it. Well, that's why, yeah, when I saw Independence Day, because I was like, that was like the big summer movie of, of 1996. I, I'm, I was like shocked, like how fucking stupid it was. And like, well, I wasn't expecting to see some like great movie or something. Like, and I'm just like, this is so fucking stupid. It's, un- it's, it's, it's literally shocking. Um, Yeah, just, just unbelievably dumb. And it, uh, it could have, uh, I mean, that premise, it's not even like you got to work that hard to make that premise work. You know, like the original War of the Worlds, I, from 1953, I mean, that that's, that's a really, you know, I, speaking of Spielberg, this, people are going to think this is crazy, but the remake of War of the Worlds from 2005? Yeah, yeah. That's actually pretty good, man. And I mean, With I don't the, like the, the I don't like the convenient denouement, but, uh. You know, like when uh when they realize what the aliens are doing, they're like grinding people into goo and then using it to fertilize the soil and make that green that red vine because they're like literally turning the earth into like Mars, like it's ecology. Like that's pretty dope. And like it's kind of gross, but it, I mean aliens are supposed to be kind of gross. And uh I thought um the scene where they're hiding out in the basement, you know, like Tim Robbins is a survivalist guy. No. And like the uh the probe comes in and then like the alien comes in and like, that's genuinely creepy. Like it's not great filmmaking, but I, I thought it was pretty good. And, um, it, uh, and I, I thought the Tom Cruise was pretty convincing. I mean, he too, yeah. like he, and it was, it seemed like fairly realistic too, because it's like, he doesn't know what the fuck's going on, but he's just like, fuck it. I'm going to bounce. So he like grabs the kids. It's just like, gets the fuck out. It's no, I yeah, yeah, yeah. And like his neighbor gets vaporized. He's just like, fuck this. Like, uh, yeah, I thought that was, I, I was surprised at that. I mean, again, it's not, it's not like great filmmaking and it can't hold a candle to the original, but, uh, but point, I guess what I'm getting at is that if people like that motif, 2005 where the world is like light years superior to freaking Independence Day. Um, yeah, everything about it's just stupid and it's, and I was surprised in Independence Day too. Other than Will Smith, who's a freaking jackass, like in Independence Day actually had a pretty good cast. And like that Jeff Goldblum, and he's dope. Like, like he really is. Like he's he's. I was watching um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers from '78, which yeah. is a that movie's dope. And there's a Body Snatchers movie that uh, Abel Ferreira did. You know, he's a dude who did like Driller Killer and Bad Lieutenant and all these like sick freaking like crime oh, movies. Yeah. It's just called Body Snatchers from '93, and uh. It stars the broad, uh, the blonde chick from Child's Play 2, and it's got Billy Worth, he's a, that, 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 that Indian dude who was in, a, who was in War Party. Uh, and it's got a, a Forrest Whitaker's in it, but it, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's just called Body Snatchers, and it, it's freaking dope. But um, in any event, Jeff Goldblum's, uh, he's, he's been in a bunch of my favorite movies, and um. So yeah, what I'm getting at is that Independence Day, there, with like minimal effort, it could have been like a watchable movie, but it's just, it's just a complete piece of shit. It's like offensively bad. Right. No. Um, but, uh, Oscar Toe asks, "Does Thomas remember the Ninja Boom of the '80s?" With of course Steven? I do, man. Hell yeah, I had a. I I could probably tell you line for line the uh, entire film Revenge of the Ninja. Ninja Three: The Domination, Enter the Ninja, Pray for Death, shit, man. I used to have, I used to have freaking copies of Ninja Magazine. Like when I go to visit my mom's family in Ventura, California, the Target there, uh, they had a huge magazine rack. I used, I used to buy Ninja Magazine. Like, like I fucking, I can tell you about ninjas all day, son. 
Like, I mean, anybody my age can because you couldn't get away from them. <laughs> and even as like a little kid, it, it like it didn't make any sense. It's like, why are ninjas everywhere? Like. Well, the yeah. whole premise of Ninja Magazine, too, it's like being be, like being a ninja is not like a job. Like, at least like Soldier of Fortune, it's like, okay, there actually are dudes who like are mercenaries. Like, even as like like 11 years old, I'd be flipping through it, be like, okay, like, like, what is it? Like, you can't actually like be a ninja. Like, so what, what's the target audience of this magazine? <laughs> <laughs> like, there's not yeah. like working ninjas who exist, but like, I, yeah. That's. No, that's that reminds me of the the critters, gremlins, like everybody. That's the craze for a little while. I don't know. Yo, know. interestingly, it's interesting you raise that, man. Like the original Critters is actually a pretty good movie, and uh, the script was written. It preceded Gremlins, and that's I think right. it's a better. I think it's a better film, honestly. And uh, the uh, you know the bounty hunter, uh, he uh, he takes the form of the rocker dude, uh, like Johnny Steele. That's his name. Yeah, yeah. And like yeah. they actually. That, that actor, he actually had a band. So, like, that song that, like, Johnny Steele plays, that's, like, actually him singing. And oh, which, really? Like, I read all about it. And that was, like, the only movie that dude was in. But it's, yeah, it's, like, and that's also why he's convincing, because he looks like some, like, rocker dude. And, like, uh, it, uh, yeah, I, I actually like Critters, man. Like, that, that was one of my favorite Midnight movies. Um, but, no, you're right. There was, uh, that, that became like a whole like genre of like you know weird creatures like raising hell and shit. But the no. Gremlins is a weird movie too. Like I, I when I was a little kid, I saw it a bunch of times because it was you know marketed as a kids movie, but it's it's kind of gross. Like it's just, in right. every sense, you know, like it's weird as it's it's a weird movie to make for kids, and like everything about it's strange. Like at the and then it was like a summer movie, but it's got a Christmas motif and like yeah. That's right. Yeah, it. Uh, and then like, and the gremlins, they're like, they're not, they're not just like these kind of fun-loving creatures that raise hell. Like they murder a bunch of people. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, that's kind of messed up too, because in it, I, I think it's Ned Beatty's the kid's dad. So it's like, okay, so you buy this weird creature from this Chinaman, it turns into this like disgusting monster, it reproduces, and like murders a bunch of people. You know, it's like, isn't this dude somehow liable for that? I mean, if, if not, like, <laughs> if not the jury, like, morally, it's like, that. that's kind of fucked up. Like, I... Oh, Ghoulies, that was the other one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sort of, like, the claymation monster, like, pops out of the toilet or whatever. It's, uh... The, um... Yeah, no, the... What was I gonna say? There's, um... Well, that was also, too, yeah, the... The weird thing about it wasn't really until the early 90s that the direct to video market became a thing, which is weird because VHS was, you know, exploding by, you know, the mid 80s. But like a lot of this, a lot of these films like Critters, they they, they, get, they were getting theatrical release, you know, like it's the Grindhouse era was done by the mid 80s, but you still get, um, you know, you, you still get movies like that getting theatrical uh, play, which is, I mean, crazy to think about these days. Nice, nice. Someone mentioned Tremors. I think Tremors is a perfect movie, like start to finish. It's got all the, the oh the, the giant worms. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, they, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. It's not a no, franchise. We don't we don't recognize the sequels, but they got it right. They got it perfect. Yeah, I, I don't think I've seen that since. A, I don't think I've seen that in thirty years. But yeah, it was a cut above most of that with Kevin Bacon, right? That's right. Yeah, very yeah. subtle filmmaking. A lot of good stuff. Yeah, no, it was a good film. Yeah, it was good. It was better. It, it was a smart monster movie. I think uh, there was, I may have been watching a documentary about it, and they said, yeah, we want to do Jaws on land. And Interesting. Like, yeah, I mean, it's basically what it was. Jaws 2 is dope. I'm always defending Jaws 2, and people act like I'm crazy, but that's that's my favorite shark movie. And I guess I'm myself something an authority on, on sharks and shark-related entertainments. Like, not like an oceanographer would be. I mean, I, I realize that, I've got like every pedestrian view of sharks, but I I don't give a fuck. I'm sticking by that um, that that claim to uh, to uh, expert opinion. And Jaws two was dull. Um, you know, Jaws three even like one of the cats who's acting on the timeline. He was pretty on three D movies. You know, because in the early eighties, when everyone was pretending yeah. it was the fifties, including Reagan, was pretending he was Eisenhower. There was like this um. There's this, there's this, there's this three D revival, you know. So there's this, like Space Hunter, and uh, Metal Storm, and all those crazy bullshit movies, and, and then Jaws three D, 
And this one dude, uh, he's like, actually, Jaws 3 is pretty dope. And um, so I, st- I rewatched it the other week. It- it's actually, like, really gruesome. You know, like, there's, like, the autopsy scene where there's, like, the dude who's, like, all chewed to pieces. And it's, like, for- I'd forgotten that for, like, a PG movie, yeah. And, I mean, the it uh, it didn't, the transfer from 3D to, with traditional 3D, the transfer never works to, like, non-3D. So, like, the effects look ridiculous. Like, nowadays, it's not the case. Like, modern 3D is a totally different thing. But that, that was, like, Jaws 3D, like, Friday the 13th 3D was, like, it it was filmed literally with like the red lens and the blue lens, you know, to, and it, um, so I mean, it, it just doesn't work, but yeah, I saw Jaws 3D in the theater with my dad when I was like a little tyke and it like blew my mind. I thought it was like the greatest thing ever, but it, um, Jaws, it, it, it's, it's a shitty movie, but it's to that dude's point. Like it's, it's better than, uh, it's, it's, it's got more of a horror element than the others. I mean, so does Jaws 2. Jaws 2 is like a slasher movie. Like, in Jaws 2, the shark's just, like, killing teenagers to be a dick. That's why I like it. Um, <laughs> and it's... Roy, Roy Scheider's awesome, too. Like, he, uh, he's just a dope actor. I, I don't know. I like Jaws 2. Nice, nice. Uh, Bruce asks, are there any ninja horror films? It would be a sick genre. That's a good question. Yeah, it really would be. Um... That's a question. Pray for, for death. Right. Pray for death is a pretty raw movie. Like the ninja's the good guy, but like the dude's wife gets like raped and murdered, and it, yeah, that's one of the one of those guinea pig movies. Those like gory Japanese horror titles. It's about a samurai who's like a like sadistically mutilating people. It's the Fear City by Abel Ferreira. Like the dude. It's about this sex murderer, and he's like this martial arts dude, and he's like he's like kung fuing hookers to death. Like I shit you not. And Tom Berenger's like this. He's like this like guy who runs a strip club, but he's like a boxer, and uh, so he like he becomes Captain Save a Ho when he like boxes this like kung fu like Jack the Ripper guy to death. That's the closest thing I can think of. Fierce City. <laughs> Does uh, Oscar Toe ask, does Thomas remember the Dungeon Master? That's the of one. Of course that, I do, man. With, uh, the Dungeon it. Master is great. Doesn't it have a wasp? In it's that got one? Blackie Lawless in it. And the movie's only like 70 minutes long. And like, uh, yeah, the Dungeon Master is freaking hilarious. It's like this dude, he gets zapped into a, uh, he gets zapped into like his Commodore 64. And like the tall, like bald dude from Night Court, he just like appears and he's like, you know, I, you, you, like you are a very skilled human, you you must face my challengers. So like he he's got to fight this like big rock monster, and then he's got to like fight this fucking uh, these like ice monsters, and then he's like in this like Mad Max scenario, and yeah, the dungeon master is dope. Nice, nice. Drew said he just bought Steel Storm, one of my favorite channels. Big thanks. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, thank you, buddy. And uh, I actually I'm 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 hoping to have Steel Storm Volume Two um ready for publication next week i gotta send it off to my dear friend mike at imperium press but i mean it's done i just gotta polish it basically and you know writing fiction is um very organic but uh it requires editing in a way that academic writing doesn't but it's uh it's it's substantially longer than steel Storm volume one and i uh I, I can't thank you enough man i I'm really honored that people like the Steel Storm brand so much. I like I really am. I'm not I'm not just being a um modest or courteous or whatever. I, it was an experiment. I mean I would have written it anyway because it I felt like it was something I had to write. And but uh you know, I I, I would have been happy if I just broke even. I it, it's it's incredible to me that the response has been so positive. So I, I got a lot of love for you, man. Thank you very much. Nice. nice. That's a great honor. I was also curious if you'd ever seen this person, Thomas, because uh, mm-hmm. a lot of people were comparing you to him, and he did. There is some overlap. Who is that? This is like a YouTuber. He he used to do metal videos, like reviewing bands, but then he also got into politics. But uh, I was just curious if uh, if this person is recognizable to you in any way. Like maybe you see this on your phone or something. No, I've never. I'm not familiar with the dude, but I mean that doesn't mean anything. YouTube's kind of like its own thing i noticed um i know that makes me sound like some broke old guy but 
what I mean is that there's dudes like on on YouTube and that's kind of like what they do. And like I I I really only check out YouTube to watch like movie clips or you know like when I deep dive into the news or something or if I'm looking for something you know like Douglas McGregor said I no I, I don't I'm not familiar with the dude. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, you might hear his name sometimes. His name's Razor Fist. And okay, uh, I was I'll wearing. Look, I'll, look, I'll look him up. I was wearing a aviators on camera, and they said, "Uh, said it looked like you and me." So, kind of a, kind of an interesting thing. Um, I, w- I wish I could pull off aviator shades. I look like a jag off, or I look like some like middle aged cop if I wear them. That's why I wear like the wraparound shades because like it. Ah. I mean, you got you got to wear like with fist your face, but if you can pull off aviator shades, like. I mean, by all means. I mean that that dude looks fine and all my I look like a fucking idiot, but Gotcha, gotcha. No, no, that's interesting. But no, I've never I've never heard of the dude, but that doesn't mean anything. Of course, of course. It's become a thing for guys. I, I mean, I don't know I know it's like everybody and his brother like uh during uh Mr. Trump's presidency like started like dropping political takes and we're just fine. I'm not I mean people can say whatever they want, but I that I, I noticed that dudes who previously were just kind of like pop culture guys, like started, um, you know, dropping that. I mean, I started dropping pop culture stuff because I mean, I, I just like that kind of stuff, but also I, I mean, that's kind of what I always did anyway. I mean, I'm talking even like years and years ago, cause it's, I, I don't know. I obsess over political stuff and theoretical stuff all day. I, I'm not a real well-balanced person and I realize that, but, um, you know, you gotta have interests outside of outside of the political, or you're gonna have kind of a miserable life. But also, I, I think the stuff all ties together, man. You know, like it, uh, um, it's part of the it, it's part of the, the the cultural pastiche is part of the environment in which you live in, and it touches and concerns politics. But it, uh, like, what I'm getting at is that I'm not just like a guy who who, who drops political commentary and, and, and thoughts on and theoretical topics who's like, oh, I gotta I gotta I gotta talk about, you know, like metal also or something. It's it was very spontaneous. And but it's also, I mean, I'm I'm fortunate people want want to consume my content, you know, so I that's why I'm always asking what people want to talk about. I mean I I I I I know what my own views are and by this point I think most people who follow me do, you know, it's, people don't need to hear about my own fucking, you know, interests all day, man. I, I want to talk about what people want to discuss, you know, and hopefully I've got something to contribute, but I mean, we're lucky because we've got, <clears throat> I mean, like we, it goes without saying, I mean, it's not a numbers game. Um, I'd be doing this if I had 10 subscribers or, or 10 million, but, uh, you know, we, we we've got a lot of really dope people who who follow our who follow our brand, um, and I, that's why I learn stuff. It, it's not as I don't just encourage people to interact here and elsewhere because uh, you know I I I I mean obviously I'd like to grow my brand within a reason, but I, I I learn stuff from everybody who shows up because they're intelligent people, and that's that's half the reason I do this. You know, it's otherwise it's like what's the fucking point, man? It's you know, you're talking to yourself. So we're very lucky, man. I, I don't take that for granted. No, no, I hear you, man. So same to you too. Surrounding myself with, you know, people in your, your inner circle, that's definitely been a big boost. Cause I remember just a few years ago, like to bring up that guy, Razor Fist, that was one of, it's one of those things where he would talk about metal and politics. So I was like, Oh, this guy knows everything. You know, sure. I don't have, I don't have to think for myself. This guy's got it all. <laughs> but, but uh he put out this tweet where he said, like death of the west is this political book that influenced him but he also drops a lot of ayn rand quotes and he drops a lot of like ron paul like libertarian takes and so it's very interesting like he doesn't really edge into the buchanan stuff like someone on discord told me it's like he read the first chapter but didn't finish it because uh he wants to be right right wing but doesn't really That's kind understand of what that means. so yeah and the death of the west when it dropped in 2002 um that that's a good that that's a good book um the only buchanan buchanan's books that i think really hit hard um his book a republic not an empire it's his longest book it's also that's basically buchanan's history book 
that right. book and his books about um the Nixon White House and Nixon campaign trail, those are outstanding. Death of the West, I mean, it's a good intro. I mean, if 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 you're if you're kind of like you know Joe conservative who's not particularly inclined towards heavy reading and theoretical topics, I think it's probably a good introduction to stuff. Um, dated as it might be. But that's yeah, that's interesting, man. That he's a that this this guy you mentioned, this razor fist guy, he's a libertarian who sometimes drops Buchanan type stuff. I mean, that may be contrived on his part because he's you know just kind of looking for subscribers. I used to traditionally the libertarian guys don't like Buchanan because you know Buchanan and Pat Schote, Pat Schote's a guy people should read. And he, unfortunately, I mean he's pretty elderly now, but unfortunately. He hasn't dropped a book since around 05 06. His last book that I know was called Dangerous Business. <laughs> and it was about uh, interdependence with China. But, you know, Cho's a Frederick List guy, you know, big economic nationalist type. And I mean, that's, you know, what I what I am. You know, I'm a, I'm a Schumpeter, Frederick List guy. And obviously, libertarians, uh, like, hate that shit. You know, they, um, so that, that's, that's peculiar. But at the, uh, but I mean, yeah, who, who knows? I don't know. But it, um, I've never understood these guys. It's I don't. When people get out of Anne Rand, she's like this like ugly nerdy Jewish broad who wrote like bad science fiction and and was full of completely unoriginal ideas. It's like what what are you guys getting out of this? You know, it's um, Murray Rothbard. I mean, I cite Rothbard all the time because he's he he was a brilliant guy, and I um I think he had blind spots in his political and uh, what he said about political economy, especially, but. Um, his book on the Great Depression, the, pe- the Great Depression is one of those things like the Second World War. People are always like, well, what's the base take on the Great Depression? I think that's reductionist, but such that you can provide people with a text that kind of answers their questions and clears up misconceptions um, that are generated by the the, the system's kind of narrative of things. Like Rothbard's book on the, on the Great Depression is, is dope. Like even if you don't agree, even if you don't abide as his... his his kind of conceptual view of, of economics and political economy, like as a hard and fast kind of history of what happened. That's an incredible book, but I, 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 I for the life of me, I can't understand like what people get out of Anne Rand. It's, it's just, it's stupid. And it's, it's just like, it's just, it's just like the midwittery of all midwittery. Like it's, right. I was like, Anne Rand was a loser. I mean, she was like some ugly broad who went around. She was like, she was some ugly broad who went around in like Renaissance fair costumes who like never did anything in her life. Like it's, you know, it's like if you're going to be, you know, if you're going to, like, fancy yourself some sort of, like, individualist Superman, like, at least pick somebody who's, like, worthy of of emulation in that regard. Like, everything about the Rand cult is retarded. And it's always just, like, really, really weird nerdy guys who are into it. Like, not, like, nerdy and, like, a like a, a, when I say, like, and, like, when I say nerdy, I don't mean, like, intellectually inclined guys. I mean, like, dumb guys who, like, are just, like, have, like, intellectual hangups and or complete midwits. The whole thing is strange, man. Like, and I, it's like this thing that won't die. It's like Scientology. Like, it, it, it's going to be crazy and stupid and retarded. It's like this totally passe thing, and it's that it just like won't go away. You know, like it, and that sucks. Like if, like if people, uh, like if somebody drops it, like I like Anne Rand, and like up to that point you thought they were cool. That's like you take a girl out a few times and she like drops on you like she used to be in like pornography. It's just like, uh, you know, it's like, why, why'd you have to, uh, it like ruins everything. Like I shit you not. It's like, then I can't be your friend, man. Like, you know, it's like, I thought you were cool, but you, I found out you're like an Anna Rand. So it's like, uh, you know what? This is right in line with what you just said. What's that? <laughs> not, not to give you, not to give, uh, not to give too much of a bad impression, but, uh, this is his take on Rothbard. Someone in the chat just reminded me. Oh, I've got like a bunch of tabs open. Excuse me. Um, so Rothbard, according to him, plagiarized her ideas, Ayn Rand's ideas, gutted their philosophical import, called it libertarianism. And then that that infamous moment where he called her or what's that article that's about her, but it's not by name. Anyways, um, so bringing back this feud between the, you know, I think this is around the 60s. But, uh, I mean, anyways. all I can tell you is that, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll reiterate what I just said. Read, read Murray Rothbard's History of the Great Depression and, uh, point out to me, like, what exactly in there was, you know, stolen from Ayn Rand. 
like I said, Anne Rand was some ugly broad who wrote bad science fiction. Like, I'm not, what, what am I missing here? They weren't even up on, Rothbard isn't even really like, a, I mean, they, they, they were discussing completely different, they were emphasizing completely different topical areas anyway, like in policy terms. Like, it's not, it's not, um, the, the, the Rand, there's, there's not some dichotomy between Rand and Rothbard, like between Schumpeter and Keynes or something. I don't, I, I don't accept that. I don't have a dog. I don't have a dog in this fight. Like it's not, I'm not some libertarian. Right. I just think that right. Anne Rand is just fucking stupid. And that goes without saying it's, it's midwit bullshit. If you're going to read Anne Rand, why don't you just go be a Scientologist? It's basically on the same level. <laughs> well, it kind of, I mean, it kind of is right. The yeah, that's, that's, yeah, exactly. Um, and if you're gonna be if, if you're gonna be like a midwit cultist, at least follow somebody who's cool. Don't don't follow ugly Jewish broads who dress up like Ren Fair characters. I mean, like, like what what do people get out of this? Right, right. No, it's uh, it boggles the mind for sure. Yeah. All right, we got um. Didn't Rothbard argue that people should decide for themselves in the age of... Oh, okay, never. Hold on a second. <laughs> Wait a second. Um, uh, Lance Meyer says, my wife loves Ayn Rand, 777. Well, there you go. There's, a, there's an endorsement. Okay, I mean, I, 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 I try to steer her away from that kind of thing, but I'm not going to tell you how to relate to your wife. Yeah, that's true. Um... Would Ayn Rand like Jethro Tull? Great question. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't like Jethro Tull. Um, I like Hawkwind. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Charlotte. Uh, all right. All right. Uh, anyone ever seen Fall of Eagles? No. What's it all about? I'm not sure. That's uh, I think that was more for the for the chat. Oh, okay. Um, what we got here. I was gonna ask you about J.T. Walsh. Is that a is that a, an underrated actor that you would uh, ever recommend by chance? I know what's, he's a, uh, what's he been in? He was in that breakdown movie. He was the the truck driver. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he was in a yeah he was in a bunch of nineties films that uh... he was in that Nixon movie. The All yeah, and he was also in um yeah. He's uh he's one of those guys like Ed o. Ross, who is like ubiquitous in a certain kind of in certain genre films. Yeah, no breakdown. I was I was I was stoked you. I had forgot about when we were talking about Kurt Russell tonight over text. I totally forgot about that movie. That was a dope movie. And um, even uh another hitch. I didn't watch. You know, I was just I didn't watch this. You're the thing that sounds silly as hell, but um, I want to see the movie in 1994. I want to see Stargate in the theater because it looked really dope. Like not the show with MacGyver, like the the movie, you know, with Kurt Russell, and I was like really disappointed, and I'm like, fuck that movie. I was like salt when I left the theater. I rewatched Stargate like a year ago. It's pretty dope. Um, there's some corny stuff in it, but it's all in all, it's pretty cool. And um, Kurt Russell is uh is always dope, and uh, yeah, that, and everybody's forgotten that Stargate was a movie too. Now they just think of it as that that show with MacGyver. The guy who played MacGyver. I realize MacGyver's not a real person. Don't be autistic, good Thomas. He's not really MacGyver. It's like, yeah, I know that. Fuck you. But um, the um, but no breakdown. Yeah, to your point, like that, that kind of genre thriller, um, type of motif uh, had a big resurgence around that era. You know, it's a cool movie, man. I was thinking about Bill Paxson the other day. Um. I think I can't. You were one of you youngsters brought up near dark. So I was thinking about that. And then you ever seen Frailty with Bill Paxton? It's a no. messed up movie, man. Check out Frailty. That's freaking dope. And because you like Hitchcock and like psychological kind of thriller stuff, yeah, you'll dig it. And Bill Paxton. So I was bummed when Bill Paxton died a few years back because I, I always thought he was dope. He was in um, that uh, one of the last things he did, I think, was Nightcrawler with Jake Gyllenhaal. Did you ever? Yeah, see yeah, yeah. 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 He died rather suddenly, man. Like I, I think cancer took him down. I mean, I, I mean, everybody dies at some point, but it, I, Paxton, it's great. He was in a, you know, he's, he's a Texas native. And when he was like three years old, uh, 
he was at uh, Dealey Plaza when Kennedy was shot. He has like a little three-year-old. Like his dad's holding him up, like in a photograph, like from, you know, November 22nd, 63, when the president was killed, which is like weird and random, like three-year-old Bill Paxton, I always thought. But he uh, he's a cool uh, kind of kind of Texas Peckerwood dude. And I watched a couple interviews with him uh on youtube and he was like a regular dude you know he, he didn't things didn't go to his head at all like with a lot of hollywood people um so yeah he's dope and near near dark is awesome man like i forgot how good that is near it's dark like, is the, it's the anti lost boys right? yeah yeah well it's all it's a it's a metaphor for you know it says it all too in the lance henrickson you know he's the vampire han show he what he he tells him like he, you know, he he fought for the Confederacy and the uh the the vampires are down and out white trash. I'm like they live like dope addicts, you know. Like that's basically and even the point. Like the cop when they, when the kid who right when he gets turned into a vampire, like the cop at the bus station assumes he's a dope fiend. You know, I mean that I, that hit me hard. I mean, and it's and it's also in it like being a vampire sucks because it is like being a dope fiend you know and like the cops are hunting you all the time and like you get sick if you don't have what you need and it i, I don't know it's i i really like it um catherine bigelow yeah uh she's one of the few lady directors is really top notch and she's also a dime piece like very, very very beautiful lady i mean she's old now she's still really pretty you know um but uh yeah so that that's interesting it's i get, uh here she did the, that movie with Willem Dafoe early in her career. I forgot what it's called. He's like a biker. The love, the the, the Loveless. That's a dope movie. Yeah, yeah. That, I was That's really an awesome movie. Yeah, yeah. The Loveless is dope. I'm glad you raised that. Uh, yeah, I really dig that movie. That's a weird movie, man. And uh, yeah, that uh, that and the original Mad Max are about the coolest freaking biker flicks I can think of. It's uh, yeah, that uh. Most very few people know about that movie. Yeah, no, Catherine Bigelow is dope, man. It, uh, I'd like, I'd like to meet a girl like that, young Catherine Bigelow. But all the girls I meet are damaged goods, and that says more about me than them. I mean, it, you know, but, but yeah, the um, no, the Lost Boys is horrible, and it's got those Corey fags in it. Like everything about it's just like horrible. Well, it's to bring it back to Gremlins. It's like they want to do like an edgy movie, but for for kids it's like a spiel yeah in on this concept which doesn't happen yeah. family friendly so and there's that like greasy guy like playing the saxophone like i don't it's jamie gertz is a dime piece and like i i i think so and she was great in less than zero so i mean she's always and billy worth is in that too and he's dope even though he doesn't have much screen time yeah it's uh if jamie gertz and billy worth had, like murdered the two corys or, like in real life like that'd be cool but yeah Wait, somebody, what is this? Uh, if you grew up, talk loud sound epicenter. If you grew up in Orange County during the 80s and 90s, have you ever, have you ever heard the old talk shows host Wally George? No, oh, no. George. I remember Wally George. He was like the West Coast Morton Downey Jr. Okay. And uh, he was like, he was a, he was a, he was a foil to Tommy Metzger. Like he'd have Tommy Metzger on and, uh, because Metzger, Metzger is on public access show, but Metzger also would like go anywhere just for like, you know, I, 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 I fucking, I think Tom Metzger was dope. I mean, like people are free to have their own opinion on that, but one of, uh, Wally George is kind of Metzger's nemesis. And, uh, I didn't know about Wally George in the later nineties, like when some of his stuff started getting replayed on cable. Like I grew up watching like around 89, 80, 89, 90, Morton Downey Jr. was what everybody watched here. Um, but Wally George was like, yeah, he was like the West Coast uh, Morton Downey. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that, but I do know Wolfman Jack. That's uh... Wolfman Jack was dope, man. Yeah, and he, Wolfman Jack's takes on, um, he was a real music historian in addition to just being an all around kind of solid Peckerwood kind of dude. But he, his point, uh, like Wolfman Jack was a respectful guy, so I mean he framed it delicately. But you know when he was, he. Whenever, whenever he'd talk about rock and roll, you know, he'd say, you know, the Beatles was not rock and roll. It was, that's what killed rock and roll. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And I mean, it's, that that's the important point that, you know, and this was really like deliberate, you know, like the fit, like what got promoted and what, you know, the, uh, 
you know, the, the kind of trajectory of pop culture, like away from rock and roll, this was not some accident and it was not just some spontaneous consumer preference. And, uh, no, Wolfman Jack was a fascinating dude. Um, I'm a huge fan of his. And when I was a kid too, he, he was, uh, he kind of reached his zenith in like the mid eighties as kind of like a national presence, you know, and like he was, he, he'd show it like even on, he'd show up on like episodes like the E-team and shit, you know, he was just kind of like, ubiquitous and uh yeah he was a uh, he was a fascinating dude and a real uh, a real music historian that's a that's an interesting point the british wave in the 60s replacing the american blues big band so it's the the anglo influence really uh really weighing down some of the americana that's interesting well, well it's also too i mean rock rock and roll really was like southern music you know when it was this like poor white music was was viewed as unseemly you know like peckerwood culture is is viewed as dangerous and something that you know should not be disseminated i mean that's really what i mean that's really what the war between the states was all about in part okay i mean it's uh pecker words are, are viewed as people who cannot behave ourselves and in part that's true but that's also part of the bar genius but yeah it um I mean that's why I mean the Beatles are just like shit anyway. I don't. It's like it's like who the hell who the hell fucking gets into this stuff, you know? Like I, I mean that honestly. I mean I realize people think I'm just dropping shade on uh on stuff I don't like, but I mean it's I mean listen to like Richie Valens, listen to Buddy Holly, listen to Eddie Cochran, listen to Elvis, and then like listen to these like faggots like listening about submarines and things. Like it's like who who gets into this shit, man? Like who thinks that's cool? I mean, there's there's plenty of music I don't get into, but I'm like, okay, like I that's dope. I can understand why people get into this. Like the Beatles is just like fucking garbage. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like it's 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 like it's like it's like the music in the head of some lobotomized retard or something. Like, and it's but then like on top of that too, it's like John Lennon became that you become that poster boy for just you know like commie bullshit. I mean, that that's like the opposite of rock and roll, man. It's it's like. You know, it's 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 conformist fucking pro system bullshit. You know, it's a no. It's uh the dynamic is really uh Elvis visiting Nixon versus John Lennon getting put on Nixon's hit list for uh, yeah 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 exactly. Nixon, so. exactly. Well, yeah, that's why Elvis was the king, man. Like Elvis was a. That's right. Hey, speaking of that, talking about new movies, I think, dude, I think you got something, and it's coming out this year. I think in the summer. What's that? This new Elvis movie. Oh, no way. With, oh, hell uh, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned that the other day, man. You should, uh, you should watch this trailer, because I when I was checking out Batman in theaters, this was uh, one of the previews. No, that's awesome. I will, yeah. you. Thanks for bringing it to my attention again. I remember you mentioned that, I, and it was not even on my radar. Yeah, no, this director, he's really, uh, he's kind of like a, it's kind of like a drama class, like very theatrical filmmaking, kind of like Les Mis type stuff. But, I mean, uh, that's for a biopic, though. That's kind of the man you need at the helm, honestly. You know, exactly. like, uh, no, that's, yeah, thank you, man. Like, no, I, I remember you, you raised it the other night, and we were, when I, we were talking about Kurt Russell. Um, oh, that's right, the John Carpenter Elvis Yeah, movie. the TV movie. John Carpenter started his two, his, his big breaks, as it were, were, were both TV movies. And, I mean, um, it was the Salem's Lot TV movie, which actually is dope. I mean, I, Stephen King is garbage, but um, the Salem's Lot John Carpenter TV movie is fucking awesome. And it's a huge homage to Nosferatu. Um, and he did, uh, yeah, he did the Elvis biopic with Kurt Russell, which admittedly is weird casting. I mean, I think Kurt Russell is dope, but he he's it's weird to cast him as Elvis. I mean, he kind of looks like a Jailhouse Rock era Elvis, but oh. not really. No, I think and I mean, in the film, the film's not bad. I mean, I think it's dope just because the, the the vital stats of it. It's like it's a John Herbiner movie about Elvis with Kurt Russell. Like that's just like that's just like fucking cool, you know. That's like a girl who's like a dime piece. It's like a great cook, and she speaks like four languages. Even if like she's kind of a cunt, like it's <laughs> that's a great resume. It's just like that, yeah. Um, but the uh, the uh, no, I I didn't even know that new Elvis movie was dropping. Um, but yeah, thanks. But that's one of the reasons I hang around young people because otherwise I. It's not just that I don't want to turn into a doddering old guy. It's because that way I know about things like this. Yeah, it's just amazing. John Carpenter being as mainstream as he is. A lot of people don't know. I mean, literally, his the beginning of his career, it seems like no one has ever 
given this a fair hearing. And uh, yeah. Well, Carpenter's a strange case, man. Well, the, the kind of tragedy of Carpenter also was that, you know, his big, um, he, uh, his big studio break was the thing. And, you know, the thing is it's recognized correctly. Now it was like one of the greatest genre movies ever made. Like the thing got like savaged by the critics and it didn't make any money. So that basically smacked Carpenter down. And then his second chance was cut with Canon films. The movie life force had something like a $20 million budget. And I mean, that that's like a $60 million budget by today's standards. So, I mean, this was like a, a real movie, you know, um, and life force, uh, or no, it's Tobe Hooper. Like, what was the second? Yeah, no, strike that. After the thing, Carpenter's Carpenter produced Halloween two and Halloween three, and then Prince of Darkness tanked. And yeah, he never had he he never had a, another hit after Halloween. Really, like Escape from New York was a cult movie, but yeah, he you know, like I was I was thinking about that, and I can't remember what the context was, but it uh, yeah, the thing. Uh, the thing got utterly savaged by the critics and it wasn't just even, it, it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just kind of industry types like, like Cisco and Ebert, like even people who it, were friendly to sci-fi and horror just like bashed it. I don't understand that. I mean, same thing happened to Blade Runner. Blade Runner dropped the same, the same, not just the same year, like the same within a few weeks of the thing and people trash that. I mean, which is crazy. People trash Blade Runner 2049. That's one of the best movies of the last 20 years. It's like, what the fuck's yeah. the matter with you? Yeah. I, I don't get it, man. But it, um, but yeah, no, Carpenter. But then Carpenter also like lost his mind and started making just literal garbage. Yeah. Like, Escape from New York is another piece of, or Escape from LA is another piece of shit. Go somewhere. Well, I don't know, man. I think there's some there's some valuable stuff in there. Maybe not uh, on an artistic level, but uh, there might be some uh some interesting I mean, stuff. I just if you wanted to if you wanted to make a remake of Escape from New York and make it some kind of like you know uh, and make it some kind of like in joke comedy, I mean, fine. And like, say you're doing that, but like he presented it as a serious sequel, and like I, the whole thing just kind of irritated me when it dropped. But it, uh, and then he, um, and then and then Carpenter he developed these like moronic political ideas too. But I. The guy's a huge drunk. I mean, I'm not. I'm the last person who can like trash anybody for having an addiction problem. I'm not trashing him for that, but it's it's affected his mind in some way. Like he doesn't. Is these these interviews he did? Uh, there's this big retrospective on horror that uh, I, I saw him on, um, and he, he just like was not making any sense. And then he was saying, uh, and he was saying that he thought his best movies were Children of the Damned and Escape from L.A. It's like, bro, what the hell is the matter with you? Like. It, it's like objectively, like these movies are pieces of shit. It's like you, you know, Halloween is not your best movie. Fucking the thing isn't. They live isn't. You're talking about Children of the Damned. It's like get the hell out of here. But yeah, I. It's a weird thing. He had a. I maintain though, he was married to Adrian Barbeau, and Adrian Barbeau is a dime piece. But you can tell she's one of these actresses who's not really acting. She really is like that nasty. And uh, I maintain that in Creep Show, you know, if she if she terrorizes like the nebbish like professor guy. I mean, that's that that's like in real life, that was like her and like Carpenter's relationship. And he used well, to fantasize about feeding her to like a giant monster. Well, you mentioned a very good point about actors that aren't really acting. And you, it was yeah. uh, Sharon, Sharon Stone in a uh, yeah. casino. And I'll throw an alpha dog. That's, that's another role where she's playing herself. Yeah. Uh, that That's, yeah. That's a hilarious movie. Yeah. Like unintentionally, but yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, Adrian Barbeau. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, Sharon Stone's horrible, and I like Adrian Barbeau, but I, you can tell Adrian Barbeau is just like is just nasty. Like you got to come all heavy, man, to like uh, to uh, to keep a broad like that correct and like kind of nerdy John Carpenter. Like, ain't the man to do that, you know? It, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, this person sent in five dollars. Tim Thomas, or it's Tim. Thomas, let me get your take on Mount Prospect. I grew up hanging out in Weller Creek. Yeah, Mount Prospect's a good town, man. I uh, the uh, the Denny's that is no longer there at the Milwaukee and Peloton Expressway. When I was in high school, that's where everybody hang out after hours. And uh, ye old town inn. I got some stories about that fucking place. Um, when my brother was alive, his band used to play there a lot, and uh. No, I, Mount Prospect's a good town, man. It's I, I'm not just being polite. I, I I like it a lot. Should I, I live basically? Basically, you go just uh, just due east on Palatine Road, 
um, and uh, that's basically where I live. So yeah, I got I got much love for my prospect, man. Uh, Libertaria question for Thomas in the early '90s. Not only hard rock, but AOR artists like Huey Lewis, John Mellencamp, Robert Tepper, etc., was also pushed out of the mainstream. Was true. white working class music? Yeah. Very true. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Now, do you are you invested in the Bruce Springsteen versus John Mellencamp? Bruce Springsteen is the corporate version of working class, and he even admits he's never worked in a factory. Versus maybe John Mellencamp, even if he has like an anti Reagan agenda like yeah that. yeah I, bruce springsteen very much was like a marketing department idea like of heartland rock you know like i yeah i i, I don't really get into that kind of music but i mean i it's probably fine people do and uh tim or whoever the the guy who just dropped we did about heartland music being deliberately kind of quashed for the mainstream he's absolutely right but yeah bruce springsteen is incredibly fake um yeah that he's very contrived and melon can't whether you love or hate Mellencamp's jams, like he's he's not a fake dude. I mean that you know, yeah, he's. I I agree with that. Spring um, also it seems like kind of an asshole. I never really understood why like, his mystique. Like he, the guy just seems like a dick. Like I I don't know. No, I hear you. I hear you. Um, Seamus, if I'm saying that right, says the music industry may be the most openly and transparently corrupt industry. Like you can buy your own product to get it popular. Yeah. yeah. No, that that's and also until it, it was um it was it was mafia controlled in in a in a way that was kind of ridiculous. I mean, and in in a way that other other is really the only media kind of industry of a non vice rated nature that was kind of overtly mafia controlled for a long time um, on the East Coast. Um, well, yeah, and you basically even. Even um, even in those markets where it was not like the whole, you know, it became known as payola. You basically you had to have the capital to bribe, you know, whatever the dominant radio station was to you know, literally promote your product. And if you couldn't, if you were unwilling or incapable of doing that, like yeah, you weren't getting anywhere. That's why um, no, that's one of the that that's why it's, I mean, bad as popular music is these days. I mean, that's why that's one of the ways the internet really kind of liberated not just the consumer but the artist i mean in, in terms of music um the uh the, the the production monopoly that the music industry had for basically a century there's there's not really anything comparable with it and um it uh there's a whole lot of garbage music out these days but there's some dope stuff too and i mean geez, just like it's like we're talking about man if you wanted like 30 even 30 years ago if you wanted to cut a demo you basically needed access to you know half a million dollar equipment you know i mean it, the people take for young guy i'm really sounding like some fucking jag off old guy like oh, young people take this for granted but i mean that being able to like literally just like record on your laptop you know like a fucking demo that's incredible man you know like even 30 years ago that would that still was inconceivable it was like science fiction <laughs> Yeah, well, like uh, like Metallica getting so big off the grassroots support, that was the tape trading scene, and the fact that yeah. the fact that by the '90s, before the internet, like yeah, they were that big on a grassroots level, which is yeah. surreal. I mean, that well, was that traditionally, big. traditionally, uh, you know, you musicians made money by touring, you know, and, and performing, and then it became like the the, the music industry monopoly. It, it became you only tour, you know, support the album. And to, and to boost sales, you know, it's basically PR, but now it's kind of like, you know, a corrective, uh, the, the, the imbalance has been corrected. I mean, so now, now it's back to what it should be. You know, you, you make money by performing and touring. Um, and yeah, that's why, yeah. And the, um, plus too, it's not even like, I mean, what's, what people, I mean, you don't hear these arguments anymore because people realize how transparent they are, but, when people used to drop, you know, 20 years ago, like, oh, you know, file sharing, like, hurts the artist. It's like, no, it doesn't, man. I mean, the, the artists were getting fucking screwed harder than anybody by um by the by the music, music industry's monopoly. You know, it's not like they were getting, it's not like they were getting the benefit of their bargain in terms of the, you know, the, the product that they were putting out. They were, they were getting chump change, you know, at um now it's, uh, then things are a lot better now in that regard. Some things are better today than in the past, particularly in terms of 
market oriented things. I maintain that some important people to keep in mind. A lot of people on the right, they they develop an, an overly negative view of things, and what, which is understandable, but it, it's important not to capitulate to that kind of thinking. We've been going for a long time. Let's uh, feel a couple more questions, and I think uh, we're going to wrap it up. Yeah, uh, Charlemagne asks uh, if you've seen the uh, uh, Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters. Yeah, it's one of my favorite movies, Paul Schrader. Speaking of uh, Roy Scheider, the the Criterion edition has got Roy Scheider's narration. Yeah, I love that movie. Very disturbing and, and really powerful. I, it's emotionally draining for me to watch it. i, I got to be in the right kind of mindset, corny as it might sound. But yeah, I love that movie. Paul Schrader is my favorite filmmaker. Um, someone asked, anyone notice Hateful Eight lifted music from the thing? Yeah, well, Tarantino, that's... The Hateful Eight is his interpretation of who is the thing at the end. So. Interesting. I didn't. I've never even seen the Hateful Eight. You might like that. That's pretty uh, okay. cool. It's also like uh, it's his uh, the Wild Bunch. And yeah, I figured that's why I'm not a Tarantino fan. Um, and he really irritated me with his uh, with his kind of gross anti fascist kind of stuff. But uh, I figured that I figured the Hateful Eight was just kind of the you know the Wild Bunch, but with faux edginess thrown in but no I'll, I'll check it out um because you, you never steer me wrong and i uh i value your opinion frankly there's one really bad scene like towards towards the end it's uh i can't i can't describe it for the sake of terms and service and because it's you know morally repugnant but no know, i i, I yeah I, I know going into a tarantino movie there's gonna be gross stuff you're not don't worry about it. I'm not going to be upset at the recommendation on account of that. I, I know what to expect. Thank you, though, for the, the admonition. Oh, someone at the beginning of the show, I should have said this earlier, was, have you heard uh, Live at Leeds, The Who? I don't think so. Yeah, that's one of those live albums that always gets pushed towards the top with uh, some of the, the British rock. Is that... Uh... No, I don't think I have. But no, I, I, I love The Who. That's why I dropped... Uh... I mean, it's about a month or two ago now, but we were talking about it's hard and how that's an unsung album. I think. I mean, I mean, people like it, but it, it, in the Who's catalog, I, I think it deserves more respect than it gets. No thanks. I'll, I'll um, live at Leeds. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll definitely scope it out. Thank you. Um. Uh, does Thomas like bro uh, Boardwalk Empire? That Scorsese. Style. Yeah, I I watched the first couple of seasons. Uh, I um I got mixed feelings about it. I think it became gratuitous later in uh the uh and some of the casting was poor. Like that that really fairyish guy who played like Jip Rosetti, like that that having some like obviously like kind of. Uh, you know, like a feminine gay guy trying to be a hard gangster, like that. That's retarded. But um, the narrative arc of a uh, of the kid who uh, goes to fight World War One, um, and his buddy uh, who's, who's supposed to be from Wisconsin who got his face shot away. I, I found that really poignant. And um, there was no plastic surgery in those days, so there the guys were horribly maimed. They they literally wear like you know tin pieces over their face and shit like that um and it captured uh that guy who plays uh al capone um is a good actor and he's he's a he's a british guy he's like this part jamaican oh, part white dude from, tom hardy I, I don't know his name but he, he's, he's he's like the short like fat guy who plays capone but he's he 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 does a shy town accent really well and uh i was, yeah. I was shocked to learn he's like a british guy i'm like no shit yeah, he's like he's like this part Jamaican, like fucking part limey guy from from the UK. But he, he pulled off like a, a, and he doesn't overdo it because like, but yeah, it's uh, he sounds like a fucking uh, like Southside Chi Town like white ethnic type dude. So I I it's better than most of what's on TV. And um, it's, I mean it kind of varies by season. Like I said, there's there's some seasons I think are dope, and some aspects of it. There's other stuff I'm just like, yeah, this is fucking crap. And yeah, but yeah, I mean it's it's all right. I really liked the old series Deadwood. I thought that was oh, dope. My dad's watching that right now. Oh no, yeah, you. I, I like your dad. When you tell me about him, he's got good taste. 
Um, right. but I that's probably the last uh, like cable series I got really into. Um, was Deadwood. I think that's where Tarantino got the idea to put a that that guy Timothy Oliphant in uh, Once Upon a Time because there's a lot of uh, old west type stuff even though it's set in 60s Hollywood there's right, like right. westerns and so a lot of that stuff I think is is very relevant when uh Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, a lot of support for Deadwood in the chat. Um oh, a uh, reminder before we Go check out the show Fall of Eagles. It's great for reactionaries. It's a uh, it's about czars and kings. He, he put out a list. Okay, okay. No, that, that sounds dope. Um, hold on. It was up here. He he laid it out perfectly, and then I, I lost the comment. Let me see. Um, but yeah, it's like a oh uh, the fall of the European monarchies, and uh, Patrick Stewart plays Lenin in Fall of Eagles. Oh wow. Oh, very Patrick Stewart's pretty dope. I don't, I don't get into Star Trek or anything, but I, I like Patrick Stewart. He did a movie. Oh my goodness. Um, he did a bunch of cool stuff. He played Ahab in a, in a Moby Dick adaptation. He was in Dune. He played uh, Gurney Halleck in the '84 Dune. Um, he's just he's just a cool ass dude. Man, I want to. It's funny because he did this movie with this actor who ended up in Star Trek. But it's it's a very interesting dynamic once you know that because uh, I think Patrick Stewart is like in some gang and he's like the young up and comer. And, no kidding. Uh, but it's uh, anyways. I'm I'm forgetting the name, but anyways. No, I, I like I like Patrick Stewart. Um, Czars, Kaisers, and Kings are the main characters in Fall of Eagles. That sounds dope. Thank you, man. I, I never even heard of it. I'll definitely check that out. Um, and then someone asked what you thought about Dune. The, the newest Dune? I think so. That's the impression I got. I mean, it's it, it, it was better than I thought it would be and less, you know, on the nose with, with political correctness. But the, the aesthetics were wrong, man. And like the like the way that as much as I, I think it, it, there's admitted problems with the 84 David Lynch Dune. But one thing that it nailed and Frank Herbert admitted this was the optics and like, you know, the the optics of the new Dune is all wrong. I mean, that's that's my main complaint of it. But I, Dune in some ways, it's so much of, there's a, there's a quality, I know this is going to sound like some fanboy fucking shit, but I don't mean it that way at all. There, there's a quality, of, Dune is incredibly psychological. There's like, a, there's something that can't, doesn't really translate to the screen, even if, you know, you had somebody who had a great respect for the source material and, was not encumbered at all by, you know, politically correct uh, um, influences. It's I. It's just one of those things that doesn't translate well, you know. But uh, so it, it could have been worse. But I, I, I didn't particularly like it. No, I, it was inferior to the nineteen eighty four Dune, which admittedly has its problems. I'm not saying eighty four Dune is like this great movie, but I mean that was my take, man. I, I know a lot of people like it, uh, the new Dune, and that's fine. I'm not putting shade on them, but I. I, I I didn't particularly like it. And then, uh, do you support Excalibur? Is that a by John Borman? Fuck yeah, that's a dope ass movie, man. That's a great movie. Great movie. Yeah, everyone's raving right now. Oh, Green Room. I think that's the one. Yeah, Green rare movie. bit. The I think that's the movie you talked about. Yeah, he's like the leader of some gang, and okay. that that young actor who's uh, involved somehow. He ends up in Star Trek, and I think it's before the movie was released, so it's just huh. a whole other layer of uh, of irony. Yeah, That's think, funny. Uh, yeah, Blade Runner twenty forty nine was light years better than Dune, pun intended. Yeah, there you go. Oh uh, yeah, I know that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that uh, that uh, that director. I, I can never Villeneuve. Villeneuve. I'm sure I'm butchering his name. I, I mean, he's he's a he's a great filmmaker, so I had high hopes for Dune. But yeah, twenty forty nine is is fucking dope, man. I it's that's. Yeah, it's an incredible movie. Um, here, what's that? Uh, someone else, uh, Jodorowsky, something like that. What? Yeah, Jodorowsky's Dune or Jordan. Yeah, that Jodorowsky was this crazy Chilean filmmaker, and he had this ridiculous idea of Dune, or Salvador Dali was gonna play Emperor shot him, but he wanted he wanted like a million dollars a minute or something ridiculous, and the uh. <laughs> 
it just like the concept art was totally insane. It was like these like Harlequin colors and plus two, that was like that was the era when like everybody wanted to like for, everybody was doing too much cocaine and trying to like put porno into regular movies. So there was gonna be like porno shit in it, and like it, it would have been like fucking horrible. Like people like missed the point of the documentary on it too. They were like, that would have been so fucking awesome. It's like, dude, no, that's not the point. The point is it would have been like fucking horrible. It would have been like Caligula or worse. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or what's you the know. Steve Bannon, uh the Steve Bannon Shakespeare movie? Yeah, it's Titus. Yeah. 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 Well, Steve Bannon's like Steve, Steve Bannon's like the Baron Harkonnen in real life. Yeah, he uh I didn't even know about that movie, but the fact that he was he was involved in it. That is just so random, and I don't know. What I think time yeah, he's he's, all, he's also like this. He's like this fat Irish prick, who like does tons of cocaine and like hangs around Jewish guys on Wall Street. That's like what happens to you. If yeah, you're like some like weird fat ass who look like if you're like some weird fat ass who's, who gets into problems with like cocaine and pussy, and like all your friends are like are like are like Jewish financial criminals, like you turn into Steve Bannon. That is the the Goldman Sachs and <laughs> <laughs> so don't. <laughs> It's like I know you youngsters want to make money, but don't don't be the token goyish guy. Yeah, like at the finance firm, like you, that that's that's what happens to you. Okay, this is why the 2016 Trump admin didn't succeed. They just didn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> they kept the wrong Steve. It should have been should have been Miller that left, not Bannon. A lot of people don't know that. But yeah, I uh, I uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna retire for the night, man, because like. We've no, been at it for an hour and 41 minutes. And I mean, this is dope, man. I'd rather do it, but you people are are wearing me out. No but, problem. Um, that this was awesome, man. And we'll we'll do this again. Um, I'm going to record for the pod. Uh, I mean, we're, we're both going to record for the pod this week. So, well, that, that'll be, that'll be dope. We'll have a lot, a lot of fresh content and uh, we'll, we'll go live again uh, a week from today. So be good everybody and again i can't thank you enough for showing up to participate yeah and thank you for all the donations too i really appreciate yeah yeah it. yeah yeah and thank oh, you for yeah. uh thank you for um for dropping donations thank you again yeah we'll see you guys very soon